Bom dia a todas e a todos. Good morning to all and each one of you in our audience. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Filomena Pacella from La Sapienza, University of Rome in Italy. She is going to give this plenary talk present us with this talk on over-determined elliptic problems and constant mean curvature surfaces. Professor Pacella is, uh, uh, does research in partial differential equations and on linear analysis, especially in problems of symmetry of um, solutions of uh, elliptic partial differential equations. Welcome, Philomena. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation and being with us this morning uh, in our summer workshop in mathematics at the University of Brasilia. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Liliani. Thank you for you to you and to all organizers of this uh, very interesting summer workshop in Brasilia. And I am very pleased uh, for this invitation. Okay, so um, as far as I understand, the, the, this plenary talk are meant for an audience, which is uh, where there should be mathematicians of different, from different areas. So I chose the, an argument, a subject, which can be in, in between, uh, let's say, analysis and geometry. So uh, what the aim of my talk would be in fact, uh, especially to put in evidence, to stress the connection between these two problems and with another one that uh, as uh, you will see. So the first part of my talk will be stating, uh, I will state classical things, and then I will move to some more recent development on this subject. Okay, so let me start with uh, uh, an overdeterminate problem. So I start from uh, the, the elliptic PDE. So the, what is this? Uh, what does it mean, uh, overdeterminate problem? So I consider a smooth bounded domain omega in Rn, and I consider this very simple linear problem, which is the Poisson problem minus delta u equal one in omega and I add the Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay, so if you just consider this problem, this Dirichlet problem, I mean, everybody knows that there is a, a classical solution of this problem, and actually the solution is unique. Then what I'm doing, I'm adding another condition on the boundary, uh, which is a, which concern, it's a Neumann condition. I, I prescribe that the normal derivative to be constant on the boundary. Then, uh, as you can understand, if I am adding another condition, then the previous problem could be not well posed anymore. So it's not obvious and it's not clear that you may have a solution. Okay, if the domain omega is a ball, then uh, of course the second addition essentially is uh, not relevant because if I have if the domain omega is a ball, the solution of the Dirichlet problem is a radial solution. And so you get for free also the second condition. So the question is whether there are other domains for which you can solve this overdeterminate problem. A beautiful result classical from uh, James Serren, a great mathematician, in 1971 claims that indeed uh, the only domains for which you can have a solution is a ball. In fact, if there exists a classical solution of this overdeterminate problem, then necessarily omega is a ball, and in fact, u of x, the solution, is necessarily this function, which is the, the solution of the Dirichlet problem. And where B, P0 is there is the center of the ball, and B is the uh, radius. So uh, this was a very nice result and uh, which was motivated at that time by many other, uh, by some physical applications. In fact, this, which were reported in the paper of uh, Serrin itself. And uh, uh, for example, one physical motivation, one physical model 
for this problem is when you have a viscous incompressible fluid which moves in a straight pipe with, uh, let's say, uh, moving in uh, parallel stream lines. And the pipe has a cross section, which is omega. Then if you uh, put a coordinate system in such a way that uh, there is one direction, uh, which is uh, directed, which is on the, on the direction of the pipe, then omega uh, can be described by the remaining variables. And then if, if you consider the function u to be the velocity of this flow, then you, you can see that uh, u satisfies the Poisson problem. And then you in, include the adherence condition, which is just the Dirichlet condition on the boundary. Then uh, this uh, uh, normal derivative uh, to be constant on the boundary condition tells you that you are requiring that the tangential stress is the same on the walls of the pipe. Okay, so the, what the theorem says is that if you uh, want that this tangential stress is the same on the walls of the pipe, then necessarily the cross section of this uh, straight pipe is necessarily a ball. And then there are other applications that you can have. One other classical application in mechanics is a torsion problem. A, 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 you have a straight bar of cross section omega and you, it's subjected to a torsion. And uh, the meaning of this, uh, of solving this overdetermined problem and is that if uh, along, when there is the torsion, uh, you require that the traction on the surface of the bar is constant, then the cross section must be necessarily a ball. Then there are many other applications, in particular in capillary problems, capillarity problems. Okay, but uh, we are mathematicians, so uh, I think there is enough interest in the mathematical question itself. So what, does, uh, the, what is the mathematical question? We would like to understand how the boundary condition can determine the shape of the domain. And then after that, also all the solution. So uh, I was, uh, my, the title of my talk, so this is, uh, I mean, let's say the classical, the most classical overdetermined problem, which started in 1971. And since then there were many other overdetermined problems which were studied. So as I, the title of my talk says, I want to speak also about uh, constant mean curvature surfaces. So let me introduce this problem and let me tell you what are the connection between the uh, overdetermined problem and the constant mean curvature surfaces problem. Okay, so let me speak about, uh, let me tell you what is. Uh, this is a classical problem in geometry. And uh, the, the question is, uh, you have a closed surface, so closed means a compact, compact and without boundary, and you want to uh, understand uh, if you assume that the constant mean curvature of this closed surface uh, is, uh, uh, is, sorry, if the mean curvature is constant, you want to understand what is the surface. So you may expect that the surface is precisely a sphere. In fact, this was proved by a famous result by Alexandrov in 1956. So the only closed smooth surface with the constant mean curvature is indeed a sphere. So the connection between the two problems, the overdetermined problem and the Alexandrov problem, comes from the fact that mainly, let's say, but there are other connections, comes mainly from the fact that they, the proof of this result are based on the same uh, method. In fact, Alexandrov, to prove uh, his uh, results in geometry, introduced uh, what is uh, called uh, now the moving plane method, which is uh, a mixed geometric and analysis method, and he used it in a local version, writing a parameterization of the surface, and it's a method which is based on the maximum principle. Okay, then years later, when Serin was uh, thinking about this problem, he had the great intuition to understand that the procedure the Alexandrov had uh, developed in the geometrical setting was indeed useful in the PDE setting. And in fact, uh, he could solve with this method, the moving plane method, which was, uh, I mean, let's say a new version, a bit an, an adapted version with respect to the one by Alexandrov, 
also to solve uh, a more general over-determinate problem, which is the one that uh, you can see here. So instead of having the linear equation, you have a semi-linear elliptic equation of minus delta u equal f of u, and you have a positive solution with a Dirichlet boundary condition in a smooth bounded domain. Then again, if you add another condition on the boundary, which is the normal derivative to be constant, then uh, again, omega is a ball. So he called uh, the moving plane method was flexible to be used in a very more, in a very general situation. Let me tell you that this device, this method, the moving plane method, after uh, certain result was used uh, again uh, by Gidas and Nirenberg in another famous symmetry result, which is uh, the one of uh, proving the radial symmetry of solution of a semilinear elliptic problem in a ball. And since then, I mean, you can't imagine how many, many applications there are. So it's a very famous and very important method in PDE by now. Okay, but let me go on with the story of these two problems. At the same time, when Serrin proved this result, so in 1971, another great mathematician, Hans Weinberger, solved the same problem. I'm speaking, I'm speaking about the first one when uh, the, the linear problem, when uh, the Poisson problem with f equal one, with an easier proof with respect to the one that was developed by Seren, which was based on integral identities. Anyway, Seren proof worked only for the Poisson problem with f equal one, and uh, the, the, the proof of this theorem by Weinberger was indeed published in the same volume of the Archive for Rational Mechanical Analysis just after Serrin paper. But uh, the story doesn't end here because later another proof of the Alexandrov result on constant mean curvature surfaces was proposed by a geometer Ray Lee in 1977 and it's, uh, and it's uh, peculiar that the proof of uh, Rayleigh was very similar to Weinberger proof, was also based on integral identities, and indeed was also uh, based a bit in, on PDE, because Rayleigh was considering the domain bounded by the closed surface, and inside this domain he was considering a PDE. So it was very similar to the proof of Weinberger, I think they were independent, but it's still interesting that, again, the two problems, which apparently can be completely different, one is a PD problem, another one is a geometric problem, they again had the same proof, similar proof. So there is a connection between the two problems that I have enlightened by the proof, but I, in my opinion, a deeper connection is still missing. In which sense? Uh, when you go to prove, uh, uh, I don't know if I have time maybe later to explain it a bit better, when you, go, when you start to prove the, the constant mean curvature problem, as I told you, Rayleigh essentially used also a PDE. It was, uh, was studying an elliptic problem inside the domain whose boundary was the constant mean curvature surface. So, uh, in a sense, even if it was not explicitly written in his paper, but if he, uh, at a certain point of his proof, he could have deduced that for this, that for this elliptic problem inside the domain omega, there was an extra boundary condition. So, essentially, he, uh, he he, he did not write it explicitly, but essentially he was uh, implicitly considering an overdetermined problem. So he could conclude his proof using uh, Serren or Weinberger results. But uh, he, could, uh, conclude, uh, he could also conclude the proof independently, which was what uh, he did. So that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying that in certain sense, the PD, if you solve the PD problem, then this implies that you can solve the, the constant mean curvature uh, surface problem. But the other way around is not clear at all. So uh, the, in my opinion, it's a very interesting question to show that if you have an overdetermined problem, like the one that I showed uh, at uh, the beginning, I mean, the classical one, let's say, and if you have, so you have this uh, extra condition of the normal derivative to be constant, 
it will it could be very interesting to start to see if this condition implies that the boundary has a constant being curved surface. Of course, if this was true, then it means that you could solve the overdetermined problem as a corollary of the constant mean curvature problem. But this is not the case. But it is indeed true in a sense, because of course you prove that the, 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 the only domain is the ball, which is a constant mean curvature surface. But so in my opinion, a, a kind of uh, investigation in this direction is, uh, is not complete. Let me tell you that if you go to unbounded domains, then, uh, and if you study the general problem with the other uh, nonlinear term f of u, not just the linear Poisson problem, then you may find some example where this is not true. But for bounded domains and for other variants of this problem, in, in my opinion, it should be true, or at least there should be some condition which uh, let you pass from the PD problem to the geometric problem. Okay, so um, now, uh, so since I want to now to expand a bit the, uh, the, the connection between these two problems and with another classical problem, so let me summarize what I have told you so far. So the, uh, like the Serrin uh, theorem is uh, a characterization of the ball. So it tells you that the balls are, can be characterized are, as the only smooth bounded domains for which the overdetermined problem has a solution. And of course, uh, the sphere are characterized by the Alexandrov result, which tells you that the only smooth closed constant mean curvature surfaces are a sphere. But uh, I'm, I want to pass to another characterization of a ball of sphere, which is also very classical, which is through the isoperimetric problem. So uh, everybody knows what is the isoperimetric problem, the, let's say the absolute, the classical isoperimetric problem, which sometimes called also, is also called the Dido problem. So what is the problem? You have a certain domain, a bounded domain, with uh, you want to fix uh, the volume or the measure of this domain, and you want to see uh, what is the domain which minimizes the, the, the measure of the boundary with the fixed volume. So, and it is a classical statement that uh, the, the minimizer is, are the balls. So in other words, you may be familiar with this classical isoperimetric inequality, which tells you that the perimeter of, for every uh, measurable set E with the finite measure, the perimeter of the set, perimeter is the measure of the boundary, is always greater or equal than an absolute isoperimetric constant, which depends only on the dimension omega n is just the measure of the unit ball in R n times the measure of the set E. So uh, let me tell you that uh, what you see here, the perimeter of the Georgi, maybe not everybody knows what it is, but was introduced by the Georgi in, 19, uh, in the 1950s, uh, in the 50s. And uh, it, it was essentially meant to study uh, domains, to measure the, the, the boundary of domains which are not so smooth. So this is, a, you can see it as a gen generalization of the uh, n minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure. Okay, so uh, in fact, the Georgi got, was one of the person, uh, the mathematician, actually maybe the first one who proved the isoperimetric inequality in this uh, general context for domains which were not so smooth. This was in 1956, if I'm not wrong. Okay, so uh, what is the connection between this isoperimetric problem and the other problem that I was mentioning before? Uh, of course, the connection, the first connection is that this is also a characterization of, uh, of the ball. But uh, uh, let me give, tell you another reason. The isoperimetric problem is, ob is obviously a variational problem because uh, it, uh, what you want to do is uh, you want to study the minimizer uh, of the functional which represent the perimeter of a domain. Okay, so it is a variational problem, but uh, it's assumed that instead of, instead of studying the minimizer, you want to study the critical points of this functional. This is a functional whose variable is a set, of course. It's a functional with respect to the set E. 
And then when you want to study the critical points uh, with the volume uh, with the volume constraint, so this means fixing the measure, then you end up that the critical points for the perimeter functional are indeed uh, domains who uh, sets domains whose boundary is a constant mean, has a constant mean curvature. Okay, so uh, then the Alexandrov uh, theorem can be uh, understood in this sense that it gives, it claims that the only smooth connected critical points of the perimeter functional are indeed poles. Uh, this was done, uh, as I told you before, Alexandrov theorem concerned the smooth connected uh, closed surfaces. But uh, so you may wonder whether uh, the, if, you, if you enlarge the class of the sets to the sets of finite perimeter, how the George was doing, whether the critical points are still those or if there are extra critical points. But in fact, they are only balls or union of finite number of balls with equal ready. And this was very recently proved by Delgadino e Maggi in the set, in the class of sets of finite perimeter. Okay, so there was a connection, there is a connection between this classical isoperimetric inequality and Alexandrov uh, theory. Okay, so what I want to, uh, to do now, is I want to uh, go on and uh, tell you some further development of the overdetermined problem and uh, on the constant mean curvature of phases. So uh, I can, in what direction I want to go. So uh, the first one is that in, in a sense, I would like to characterize, instead of characterizing balls or spheres, uh, with these two with these two problems, I would like to characterize uh, uh, domain, for example, spherical sectors. Okay, not so not the ball, but just a piece of a ball, and uh, surfaces which are a piece of a sphere. Okay, <clears throat> I will. Okay, I will uh, explain to you uh, what kind of generalization I have in mind. On the other side, for the overdetermined problem, uh, I want to address the question whether uh, if I impose a, a double boundary condition on uh, just one part of the boundary, not on the whole boundary of the domain, whether I can uh, reach the conclusion that the domain must be necessarily something. Okay? So, uh, uh, let me uh, show you the setting in which I would like to move. So this is some uh, very recent research, uh, research that I did with Giulio Tralli, and then I will tell you also the motivation for this, uh, for this uh, new point of view. Okay, so what I would like to consider, let me start with uh, the overdetermined problem, and uh, I want to consider domains which are inside a con. Okay, so what is a con in our N? I take uh, an open bounded domain on the unit sphere, small omega, and then I consider uh, the con which is generated by this uh, small omega, okay, in the usual way. I'm just taking one side of the con, so t is positive, the parameter t is positive. So, then inside this uh, con, I consider sets, and I will, uh, okay, it's better to pass to, the, to some picture. Okay, so uh, if you look at the picture to the left, for example, so I'm considering a con. Inside the con, I'm considering uh, some set omega. Okay, then omega, in the way you can see in this uh, picture, has a, a boundary, and the part of the boundary, which is, uh, which is the part which I call the gamma, is a surface which is uh, enclosed inside the con. And then we'll, there will be a part of the boundary of omega, which I call gamma one, which instead intersects the boundary of the cone. Okay, so more or less you can think about this omega like the formation of a sector uh, in, in a cone. Okay, and let me call this domain a sector-like domain because it's more or less uh, a, a sector. So, uh, in particular, you could have uh, a, a precise spherical sector which is just the intersection of the con with the ball, okay? In this case, when I consider a precise spherical sector, 
with the vertex in the vertex with the center sorry in the vertex of the cone the boundary gamma the one which is inside the cone is also obviously is a piece of the sphere okay it's a piece of the of a certain sphere with a certain radius okay let me tell you also that <coughs> gamma which is the part of the boundary which is inside the cone which is usually called a relative boundary okay so there is a, the domain omega will have a relative boundary which is inside the cone which is gamma and we will have another part of the boundary which is gamma one which lies on the boundary of the cone uh, you may have a different kind of this uh, sector like domains like the one to the right where omega is, um, does, for example, does not contain uh, the vertex of the cone on its boundary. The only assumption that I want in order not to make my problem trivial is uh, to that I would like uh, that the measure, the n minus one Hausdorff measure of uh, gamma and the n minus one uh, Hausdorff measure of gamma one are both positive. Uh, why? Because if uh, this is not true, then uh, you can uh, think that the domain omega is all contained in, inside the cone, so it does not intersect the boundary of the cone. Then whatever I'm saying from now on will be exactly the statement of Serrin and Weinberger. There is, no, uh, there is no, no change on that. So the interest here is that I have this relative boundary inside the cone, which is not the whole boundary of omega. Okay. So in, uh, for a domain like this, I am considering, uh, again, a Poisson problem, minus delta u equal 1. And then uh, I, uh, I, I put a, a Dirichlet boundary condition, u equal 0 on gamma. Uh, I recall that gamma is the part of the boundary which is inside the cone. And the normal derivative is uh, zero, so it's a Neumann condition, zero Neumann condition on the other part of the boundary, which is gamma one. Okay, so now if I stop here, if I don't add, add the fourth equation, the fourth condition, this is a well posed problem. It is a mixed boundary problem with the Dirichlet condition on one side of the, on one part of the boundary and the Neumann condition on the other part. So it's a mixed boundary condition problem. And if the, the uh, I mean, the, the, the intersection between uh, the closure of gamma and gamma one is reasonable, in particular, for example, if it's orthogonal, then this has uh, only one solution. So it's, it's a well posed problem. But now uh, I'm adding another condition. The, uh, the other condition is that the normal derivative is a constant on gamma, on the relative boundary. So this means that uh, <coughs> on the part of the boundary where there was a <coughs> where there was the Dirichlet condition, I'm imposing also a Neumann condition, but uh, not zero. The normal derivative is a, is a constant, which is indeed negative. And then I wonder, whether this overdetermined problem has a solution. Again, if you think about the per precise, the perfect spherical sector, the one which is in, in, the, in the center of this, uh, of this slide, then it, it is obvious that there is a solution. If you take the, just the radial solution for the certain problem, this is also a radial solution inside this cone, and it's obvious it satisfies the all uh, boundary conditions. Okay, so the question is whether this is the only one. So uh, the question is whether the spherical sector can be characterized through this overdetermined problem. So the theorem that we could prove uh, with Giulio Tralli in 2019 uh, is the following. If you assume that the cone is convex, and if u is a classical solution of this problem, classical means that all the derivatives which appears are in the classical sense wherever they are defined. So wherever omega, gamma, and gamma one are smooth. And if you assume also that the solution u is in the intersection of these two sublef spaces, then uh, we can prove that the domain omega this, this kind of a sector, uh, sectorial domain, sector-like domain, is indeed a sphere, is indeed a ball. It's indeed, sorry, a portion of a ball. It's a spherical sector. It's, it means that it's the intersection of the cone with the ball. With the ball centered where? Centered at a point P0, which is always the vertex of the cone. 
So it is precisely the spherical sector that I was uh, pointing I, uh, you out in this picture, except when uh, the cone has some flat portion of the boundary, in which case the domain can also be a half sphere lying on the boundary of the, of the cone. So let me pass to a picture. Yes, so you, if, the, if the cone has a flat part of the boundary, then you have two alternatives. Either you have half a sphere or you have a spherical sector. But if the cone does not have a flat portion, like for example, assume that it is a strictly convex cone, then it's a precise spherical sector with the center at the vertex of the cone. Okay, so this is a characterization of uh, the spherical sectors. Uh, let me just make a comment on this condition that the solution belongs to this uh, to the intersection of these two sublev spaces. Uh, let me tell you that this is a kind of a gluing condition between the two uh, portion of the boundary where I have the Dirichlet condition and the Neumann condition. Why? When you have a mixed boundary problem, in general, you may have a problem with the regularity and uh, in, in the part of the boundary where the two, the Neumann boundary, the Dirichlet boundary intersect. So this is uh, well known. So, uh, so the, the, the assumption that we are having is implicitly means that you must have some angles, let's say, between these two parts of the boundary, which allow the solution to be in these Sobolev spaces. But let me tell you that a simple case where this is always satisfied, so this is not an assumption anymore, is when gamma and gamma one, so the two, the two parts of the boundary intersect orthogonally. Then you can prove, uh, we could prove directly, but probably it is uh, well known, that in fact uh, then the solution is uh, regular. Uh, keep in mind also that you have another irregularity in this domain, which is the vertex of the cone. In general, you lose regularity when uh, when you have a, a domain with a, with a with a conical point. But uh, again, when the cone is convex, you you recover also this uh, this regularity in these sublev spaces. This is due to some classical result by Mazia and Adolfson and Jerison. Okay, so uh, I have told you that uh, through this uh, overdeterminate problem. Uh, so we are able to characterize the spherical sector among all the other possible sector-like domains. Okay, so let me pass now to the constant mean curvature problem. So what I would like to do now, I would like to characterize uh, surfaces inside the cone, surfaces with boundary. Okay, so now let me give you a very uh, stupid maybe statement but obvious statement, assume that you have a, a surface with a boundary, okay? And, and you may ask uh, whether if the, consta, if the mean curvature is constant, this surface must be a, a piece of a sphere. Then this is obviously not true because you have plenty of constant mean curvature surfaces. You have cylinders, so surface which are a surface of cylinders, you have Delaunay surfaces, you have uh, something which is called catenoid, uh, onduloid, uh, there are several, in particular there are rotational uh, symmetric uh, surfaces that you can have. So if you take just one piece of this surface, will be a piece of surface with a boundary with a constant mean curvature, and there is no reason why this should be a piece of a sphere, okay? So uh, in order to, to characterize uh, constant mean curvature surfaces as a piece of a sphere, you have to impose some kind of a boundary condition on the boundary of the surface. So what will be the setting that we want to consider is the following. So we have a surface gamma. So now forget about the, the domain omega, even if I have, I have written here omega, but our attention now is on the surface gamma. So take the surface gamma, and uh, which is inside the cone, okay? And uh, which has the boundary, and assume that the boundary of this surface intersect the, sur the, the boundary of the cone. In all three pictures that you are... Uh, uh, looking at, so you will see this is the situation, okay? 
So then I may ask uh, if I take a surface inside the cone, which is uh, which intersects the boundary of the cone, and now it's reasonable to, 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 to ask the question whether this gamma is a piece of a sphere. Okay, again, I must tell you something more about the way gamma intersect the cone. Otherwise, again, it is not true because you take any piece, any, for example, a cylindrical surface intersecting a cone, there is no reason why this should be a piece of a sphere. Okay, so what we can prove? What, what is a good way of uh, posing this problem? So uh, the result that we got with the Giulio Tralli uh, is, is the following. It's parallel in a sense with the other one with the overdetermined problem. Assume that the cone is convex again and assume that the gamma, so the gamma is uh, an n minus one dimensional manifold with the boundary and the boundary is lying on the boundary of the cone and assume that it has constant mean curvature which is a constant h positive. Then assume that the gamma and the boundary of the cone intersect orthogonally. So now I'm imposing a condition on the way the surface intersected the cone. Then I can prove that the gamma is indeed a spherical cup, it's a, it's a piece of a sphere, with the center again at the point P0, which is necessarily the vertex of the cone, if the, um, if the cone does not have a flat uh, portion. If it has a flat portion, again, it can be half a sphere. So we have again these two alternatives, and in particular, for example, in strictly convex cone, gamma must be necessarily a portion of a sphere, a piece of a sphere centered at the vertex of the cone. So this gives you a characterization of the of pieces of a sphere. Uh, but uh, our theorem, uh, I was uh, telling you with uh, this, con I was stating the theorem with the uh, orthogonal intersection because it's a bit easier. But in fact, we had a more general gluing condition between the surface and the cone, which is expressed about this integral, uh, this integral to be zero. Okay, but for, for our purposes, it's enough to understand the case of, of orthogonally glued, uh, glued uh, sur surfaces. Okay, so, but uh, let me tell you that uh, after we proved this theorem, we uh, realized that uh, this theorem had already been proved by Cho and Park in 2011 in, in geometry, and with, in fact, some proof which, uh, which was a bit similar. Our proof relies, uh, like the proof for, for the overdetermined problem on integral identities. It's a bit similar to the proof uh, of Rayleigh somehow. And it uses the PDE. It uses a PDE equation inside the, uh, the domain omega, which is, uh, which is uh, how do you say, whose boundary is gamma in the boundary of the cone. Okay. So that's why this, uh, we got uh, both the result for the overdetermined problem and for the constant mean curvature surfaces, uh, uh, let's say, in, in a parallel way, let's say in the same paper, because the, the method of proof for, the, the, for those two problems, the overdetermined and the constant mean curvature surface, was similar. Okay. So, uh, but I was saying, so there was a previous proof, but uh, however, um, in our opinion, in this proof, which essentially is similar to our proof, actually ours is similar to theirs, but we did not know, but they, there are not so much details. And also it's not clear that everything is really well done. There is a, some small gaps in, uh, because they, for example, they consider, as I told you, a PD problem inside the domain, but uh, they, they don't consider enough regularity uh, to, in order to state everything precisely. But anyway, the, the, the proof is similar to ours and uh, for sure the result is true. Okay. Okay, so uh, here I, I'm just saying that uh, our, what I just told you before, that our proof for the overdetermined problem was, uh, was inspired by the proof of Weinberger and the, for the constant mean curvature surface by the one of Rayleigh. Let also, let also, and both exploit the, the PDE problem. 
that also me point out that uh, there is another uh, result, another proof of the classical Alexandrov result, which was given in 1991 by Montiel and Ross, which was independent of the associated elliptic problem. And uh, also this proof works in the context of cones, in convex cones, but only when the surface and the cone intersect orthogonally. Okay. So now let me, uh, let me give you some motivation and inspiration about uh, why, so why did we came up with this problem in cons? Uh, as I told you before, for uh, concerning the classical statement by Alexandrov about the constant beam curvature surfaces, they were related to uh, the classical isoperimetric inequality. Though they are independent results, but they are related because the constant mean curvature surfaces are the critical points of the perimeter functional. So uh, we were in fact inspired also here by a relative isoperimetric inequality in cons, which indeed was something that I obtained many, many years ago in 1990 in a joint work with Pierre-Louis Lyons. Uh, we were studying at that time the symmetrization uh, for functions which were not zero on the whole boundary. So we came up in studying some mixed boundary problem and uh, for uh, to study the related Sobolev spaces and the best constant in Sobolev spaces, we were uh, uh, motivated to study an isoperimetric inequality in cons. Okay, so in 1990, we had this isoperimetric inequality 30 years ago, which was indeed a characterization of a spherical sector inside the cone. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, what it says, uh, what is the, the, the relative isoperimetric inequality, what is the relative isoperimetric problem, is the following one. Assume that you have a cone and assume that you have this domain omega, uh, as in this picture, then, uh, and assume that I'm fixing the measure of omega, okay? And then I ask, what is the domain omega inside the cone, which has the minimal, the smallest relative boundary, smallest in terms of uh, perimeter, let's say. So among all domains inside the cone with the fixed volume, what is the domain which minimizes the perimeter of the boundary which is inside the cone. So the, what I'm calling here gamma. So again, our attention will be on the part of the boundary which is inside the cone. Okay, so you may expect that uh, the best domain is uh, the spherical sector. And this is indeed what we proved uh, with Pierre Williams. And uh, so we proved uh, essentially this uh, this isoperimetric inequality here, which holds in uh, when uh, the cone is convex again. Again, the convexity of the cone is playing a role. So uh, what does it say is that if you have uh, a convex cone and E is any domain inside the cone, and then uh, P sigma omega of E is uh, what is called the relative perimeter. So it means it is the measure of the boundary of the set E which is inside the cone, okay? Then you have, uh, the, this is called the relative isoperimetric inequality, which is very similar to the one which, which you have, uh, that you have uh, in the classical statement, except here omega n is not the measure of the unit ball anymore, but is the measure of the unit uh, spherical sector, uh, so in the intersection of the cone with the unit ball. Okay, so equivalently, uh, we can say that the only measurable sets inside the cone which minimize the relative perimeter with the volume constraint are the spherical sectors. Okay, so this is a characterization of spherical sectors. So uh, we proved this in 1990. Years later, this theorem was proved again by Ritore and Rosales in 2004 using uh, uh, calculus of variation methods. And then in 2013 was reproved again by Alessio Figalli and Intrei 
using optimal transport uh, methods. And then again, it was reproved in 2016 by Cabré, Rosoton, and Serra using Alexandrov, Bachelman, Pucci inequality. Uh, let me point out that the Figal in Ray among these proofs was the one uh, which did not need the smoothness uh, uh, of the cone, but uh, I mean, he, he could uh, use Lipschitz C1 cone, in C11 cone instead of, the, of using C2 cones, let's say. And, but anyway, in all these proofs, uh, they, they require the convexity. Okay, uh, so uh, this theorem uh, gives the shape of the minimizer as, uh, as I was uh, telling you. So then uh, if you take, uh, uh, this is a variational problem, so I'm minimizing uh, this, array, this functional which represents the relative perimeters. And then it's not difficult that if, if uh, instead of studying the minimizers, you want to study the critical points of the perimeter functional, the relative perimeter functional, then uh, what are uh, this, uh, this set, what are the critical points? The critical points are sets, of course, whose relative boundary, so the part of the boundary which has the cone, has a constant mean curvature and intersect the cone orthogonally. So if you study the uh, constant mean curvature, the surface inside the cone, which intersect the cone orthogonally, you are essentially studying the critical points of this uh, perimeter functional. So the results that we got with uh, Giulio Tralli so says they, in fact, uh, characterize the critical points of this functional in convex cones. Okay, then uh, from this came the idea that we could also characterize the partially overdetermined problem, because uh, we knew that these two problems were uh, somehow parallel to each other. Okay, so now let me spend some few words about the, the problem, these problems in cons. So as far as, uh, uh, for what I have told you so far, I, I have always speak, uh, spoken about uh, convex cons. So you may ask whether the convexity of the con is necessary. So uh, for the relative isoperimetric inequality that uh, we obtained with the Pierre Louis Lyons in 1990, we used an, an inequality, a standard inequality, classical inequality, uh, set inequality, inequality which involves the measure of sets, which is called the Brumming-Koski inequality. And for that, the convexity of the cone was essential. But also the other proofs by Rito Rey Rosales and Figal Indrei and Cabré and others, they all require the convexity of the cone. So it seems uh, quite uh, an important, it's an important condition. In fact, you can have, at least in the context of the relative isoperimetric inequality, you can have uh, counterexamples uh, by just taking two ice cream cones connected by small tunnels. But on the other side, uh, Byron Figalli recently in 2017 proved that if you have a cone which is almost convex, so which means it is very close to a convex cone with respect to the Hausdorff distance on the sphere and in a certain class, C11 uniform class, then you still have the isoperimetric inequality in the same way I, I, as I told you. So, uh, the, I mean, the, as you say, the, the, the boundary between having the isoperimetric inequality or not having it is not clear. So, but for sure, you, if you go out from the class of a convex con, you cannot claim that it is always true. But anyway, surprising. So you can ask the same thing for, for example, for constant mean curvature surfaces in con. Can you remove the convexity of the con? And then surprising, surprisingly, we could have a result in any con adding a, a different kind of assumption, and uh, which is again a result that I got with uh, Giulio Trani. So now uh, my sigma, my con, is uh, any con, so it's not uh, convex, no, whatever, call you, uh, whatever con you want, smooth except uh, in the vertex, of course. And then you consider again uh, a surface inside the con, and the boundary of the surface gamma is on the boundary of the con as before. And again, you assume that the gamma has a constant mean curvature. 
And okay, here you do not have to assume that uh, the, the curvature is positive, but then it comes after the proof. But uh, uh, then you put another condition. So the cone is any cone, but on the surface, you put the condition that the surface is strictly star-shaped with respect to the origin. Origin is the vertex of the cone. So what does it mean, strictly star-shaped? That x uh, that uh, scalar, the normal uh, on the surface uh, gamma, is uh, positive. And then we add, uh, again, a gluing condition, inter condition between the intersection of the cone and uh, the boundary of gamma, which essentially is always satisfied again, when the, the surface intersects the cone orthogonally. Okay, so let me um, point out that strictly for a surface to be strictly star-shaped, it means that it is a radial graph with respect to the small domain on, uh, on, uh, on the uh, unit sphere. So it's a polar graph. So then the conclusion is the same. Gamma is, uh, must be contained in, uh, uh, in a sphere, in the boundary of a ball centered at point P0. And actually, uh, this time we were able to prove that P0 is necessarily uh, the vertex of the cone when uh, the intersection is orthogonal. OK, so uh, this is an interesting result in geometry. And, uh, as far as I know, this is a new result in differential geometry. So it tells you that uh, every constant mean curvature radial graph intersecting a cone orthogonally must be a spherical cup centered at the origin. So we do not need the uh, convexity of the cone, but we uh, assume now that the surface is a radial graph. So the proof of this result, of this other result, is different from the one uh, in convex cone. So it's different from uh, the, we don't, we did not use neither uh, an associated elliptic problem, neither we use the integral identities, but uh, we use some pointwise inequalities. And it, it is a bit funny that our proof was inspired, was inspired by an old proof of, uh, due to Gellet in 1853, which my, my colleague uh, Giulio Tralli discovered, just a bit by chance somehow, uh, which uh, this, this guy, Gellet, uh, in, in 1853, gave uh, a, a partial proof of Alexandrov result. And Alexandrov result was approved in 1956, but so 100 years ago, the, the, the question of characterizing cost and mean curvature surface was, uh, was, was already an important question. And Gellet could prove the, that it was a sphere among the star-shaped uh, uh, surfaces. So uh, my colleague knew about this, uh, this result. And so we, we saw that it indeed could be adapted also in our case. So for radial graph, you do not need the convexity of the cone. So uh, once you get this result in any con for a radial graph or star-shaped surfaces, then you may ask whether uh, you could, uh, how do you say, modify the proof so that it works also for the overdetermined problem. So uh, what, what does it mean? So assume now that the con is not convex and I have a partially overdetermined problem in a domain in a con, and now the domain is star-shaped, can I claim that the domain must be necessarily a, a, a spherical sector? Uh, we could not prove this. This is an open question. In my opinion, it's very interesting because the class of radial graph is, is very important also in the isoperimetric inequality and for many questions in geometry. So it would be very nice to prove this theorem for star-shaped sets, but we were not able because the proof that we had for the constant mean curvature problem was not similar to any proof and was not, could not be adapted to solve the, the PD problem. And my opinion is in general that the PD problem is more difficult than the, than the other problem. Okay, so um, I think that my time is almost over. So I wanted, I had prepared some slides uh, to show you uh, that also the overdetermined problem can be seen as a, a variational problem. So uh, I, I was telling you that the, the constant mean curvature problem is a variational problem if you think of it 
as uh, the problem of finding the critical points of the perimeter functional under a volume constraint. So it is a variational problem. So again, in my effort to make a parallel between the overdetermined problem and the constant mean curvature problem, uh, I was uh, addressing the question, I, sorry, people were addressing the, the question, whether also the overdetermined problem can be seen as a variational problem. And in this, this, this is true, and one can uh, use a, a functional, which is the torsional rigidity functional, but I do not have time now to explain you what it is. But there is a variational, a very interesting variational formulation of, 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 of the overdetermined problem, which can be adapted also to the case of the, through this functional, which is defined uh, on a set omega, which involves a weak solution of a partial, uh, of a mixed boundary problem, can be also adapted in the case of the con, but I don't want to steal your time more than this. So let me just complete uh, with some, complete my talk with some open question. So uh, it would be very interesting to study the overdetermined problems in a more general setting for a more general semi-linear elliptic equation as Seren did. Our resulting cons also only works for the Poisson problem, minus delta u equal one, because we were using this proof based on integral identities. The, the original proof by Seren, which was inspired by Alexandrov through the moving plane method, cannot be adapted to the case of the con. So this is a very big uh, obstruction to, to, to getting more uh, general result. Then, uh, okay, we had this problem in cons because we were motivated by this isoperimetric inequality, by some physical uh, problem, and by, uh, let's say, the fact that we wanted to, to characterize special domains. But you may study the overdetermined, partially overdetermined problem also in other geometries. So you have to think that the con is, is a bit like a container for your domain, and you are uh, uh, you want to see what happens inside the con. But you could think about other geometries. You could think about the problem uh, posed in cylinders, for example. And these are very interesting in capillarity problem when you want to study the equilibrium configuration of, of on a liquid inside the container. Then, uh, as I told you before, it would be interesting to understand better the relation between uh, the normal derivative to be constant on gamma and the gamma having a constant mean curvature. And then again, and then also um, there are, uh, it would be very nice to have a counter example in particular in non-convex con for the overdetermined problem. The counter example that is known so far, it's only for the isoperimetric problem. And in my opinion, among the three, uh, these three class of problem that I have uh, introduced uh, to you, the, uh, the PD problem, the overdetermined problem is the most difficult one. So uh, it is the one which requires, in my opinion, more new ideas and new efforts. Okay, so I don't want to, to steal more your time. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Filomena, for the very nice talk showing the PhD students and our students this uh, interface between PDEs and geometry and all these questions. Um, the comments uh, on our page are saying thank you, wonderful talk claps and everything <laughs> I have a, before they ask you we have a, a couple of uh, minutes maybe oh thanks for the wonderful talk very interesting uh, we have a, a couple of minutes i'd like to start with a question if there are no other questions philomena uh, this um, solving the the problem is is also finding solutions, functions that realize some Sobolev best constants? Uh, no? it's, re it's related. The, the, best, the best Sobolev constant is related to f of u equal uh, to some uh, exponent, right? Okay. <laughs> so, 
uh, it is related uh, through if, if one can solve a more general uh, problem. It is related as in the same way as the isoperimetric inequality is related to finding the best Sobolev constant. Yes, there are relations. Danilo is asking a question. Thanks a lot for the most clear and interesting talk. Could you say a bit more about the integral gluing condition? Oh, the integral gluing condition. So let me, uh, okay. There is one, uh, the integral gluing condition uh, in, for example, let, let's take one, for example, uh, uh, there were two different gluing condition. Let me, I'm oh, sorry, I'm, let me just, okay, here. This one, for example. So what is this integral condition? This tells you that, uh, you see, what is n of x, n x? And a point, so you, are, you have gamma, you have the boundary of gamma, x is on the boundary of gamma. And x is the conormal, is called. What is the conormal? Is the, is the normal to the boundary of gamma, which belongs to the tangent space to gamma. Because the boundary of gamma has a co-dimension n minus two. Has, has co-dimension two, sorry. Okay, so this tell this is some this tells you some indication on the angle that the gamma must form with the boundary of the cone. So if it is orthogonal, this is always zero. Okay. okay. But if it is not orthogonal, this scalar product may have different sign. Okay. So what this condition tells you that you can allow different angles on certain part of uh, the boundary of gamma, of gamma, gamma can intersect with the different angles, but there must be a compensation when you go along the boundary of gamma, so that this integral must be zero. And this is interesting because, uh, as I told you, there, there are constant mean curvature surfaces which are not spheres, okay? And if they are not sphere, then this integral cannot be zero because this condition tells you that they are zero. So this mean, this gives you a condition for uh, constant mean curvature surface different from spheres to intersect mm -hmm. the bond. Thank you. Okay, I don't see other questions, just uh, compliments. Okay, so Filomena, thank you very much for sharing this, uh, ideas and uh, open problems for to instigate to our students and let's hope to meet sometime soon yeah here in especially in brazil i would i would yeah. hope <laughs> the summer meeting again okay ah, so I, uh, there is some uh, how do you use the, know, the, the chat no okay there are no other. No, the, someone is asking on how you use the orthogonal condition in theorem two. Uh, what is theorem two? Sorry, theorem two is the one about the constant mean curvature surface. Uh, because uh, when you use, uh, I mean, the simple way to do this, uh, uh, see it as a, as a way of um, bypassing the problem when you have uh, a domain inside a cone. So when you try to when you try to adapt, for example, the proof by Weinberger or by Rady, you do not you do not have the boundary of the surface. Okay, so when you have the boundary surface, you have extra pieces. Okay, so you 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 use some integral identities, use some device, and then you end up with extra pieces that you cannot control in general. These extra pieces depend on the angle the surface form with the cone. So. Orthogonality is the easy way in which you get rid of this of uh, this uh, <laughs> these pieces, let's say. But it's also the most natural thing because, uh, as I told you, when you when you study the critical points of the perimeter functional, the condition that you have is necessarily the orthogonal intersection. So this is the natural condition, but uh, can be a bit generalized. But you have to control the sign of the certain uh, integrals. Thank you very much. And there are some other questions here. I don't know if we have time. Please let me know. 
Uh, maybe the last question, Professor Filomena, could you talk some more about the shape optimization part? How the PDE influences the derivative of the functional J? Ah, no, no, no. Um, uh, sorry, I was very fast on this part. So maybe I don't know. Okay, I cannot go back to my sharing my screen, sorry. But anyway, uh, this should be explained very well. So what I call the J is the energy. Uh, think about the Serran problem, for example. In every, domain, uh, in every domain, you have a solution of the Poisson problem, which has a certain energy in the sub space. So what I call the J is the energy of the solution in a specific domain omega, okay? Then uh, you, you take the, the torsional energy functional is the one which associated to every domain omega, the Sobolev energy, the Dirichlet energy of the solution. So in this way, it becomes, uh, becomes uh, how do you say, a functional of sets, not anymore. So it's not a functional in the Sobolev space, it's functional of sets. So it's the functional which associated to each set the Dirichlet energy of the solution. Of, uh, of the Dirichlet problem for this, for the Serran. So uh, in order to find a critical point, when I mean critical points, I mean critical with respect to the domain variation. So you have to differentiate with respect to the domain. Okay. Sorry, it cannot be more <laughs> very clear, I know, but it, it requires a bit of time. Thank you so much. And I invite all the audience to see our next plenary talks. There are many interesting things. And again, we thank uh, Philomena. So, so goodbye to everybody. And I hope to see many of you soon without any pandemic, free of everything. and. Uh, uh, relaxed in Brazil or in Italy, wherever you want. <laughs> okay, goodbye to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your attention.